thank you. Uh, very happy to be here. First, let me say this is my third visit to this new building here in Houston. And I have to say, each and every time, it takes my breath away. Uh, so uh, I want to say thanks, especially to uh, Thomas and John and Bonna for inviting me back uh, today. Uh, last time I was here, I spoke about uh, U.S. engagement with, with Myanmar, another country I've been involved with for many years uh, with Track 2, um, and that is actually proceeding quite well uh, with some bumps in the road. Um, and I'm really pleased to be back to talk to you about Iran. Um, so I, I want to start by discussing the current status of the interim agreement on the nuclear program, and then move through uh, some of the things, reasons why I think it came about, what are the key challenges ahead, and also look at the potential for deepening US relations with Iran outside of the nuclear issue. Um, so of course, on November 24th, 2013, Iran and members of the P5 plus 1 group, uh, which is the permanent five members of the Security Council, China, France, Russia, the UK, and the US, and the plus in the plus one is Germany, uh, reached an interim agreement that freezes elements of Iran's nuclear program for a six-month period. And during that six months, the expectation is they will negotiate a final comprehensive deal um, that will uh, result in um, uh, freezing any military-related aspects of the program that could lead to a nuclear weapon. Um, I'd like to begin with the foundation of this historic agreement. It was actually established through a series of carefully orchestrated exchanges between the United States and Iran that were conducted in secret. Uh, since 2012, the Sultan of Oman hosted meetings that brought together senior American officials with senior Iranian officials, um, happening usually in Muscat, the Omani capital. Uh, Deputy Secretary of State Bill Burns led these back-channel negotiations on the U.S. side. Now, why Oman? Uh, it's close proximity to Iran, it's low-key uh, nature, uh, made it a good meeting place for uh, officials to meet in a very low-key way. Additionally, I think the Obama administration uh, heightened Oman's role as an intermediary uh, following the um, constructive role they played in helping to secure the release of the three American hikers who were being held in Iran. Uh, the fact is, is that Oman has played a um, constructive role in the relationship for a very long time. Uh, when diplomatic relations broke down between the two countries following the 1979 Islamic Revolution, uh, Oman was used to relay messages uh, between the capitals. So this is a long-standing type of role that the country has played. In July 2012, the first high-level uh, meetings between Iranians and Americans took place during President Obama's tenure. Uh, in March 2013 was a particularly important meeting. A small team of American officials met Iranian officials in Muscat. And at that meeting, uh, it's been reported that Secretary, Deputy Secretary of State Burns delivered to the, his Iranian counterparts a key message, and that was that the United States was prepared to explore an agreement allowing Iran to maintain a civil nuclear program that included the ability to enrich uranium if Tehran accepted limits to preclude the program from being used to develop nuclear weapons. So this was really a turning point, uh, I think, that made the negotiations possible. Uh, in November 2013, when uh, Secretary of State John Kerry went to Geneva for formal talks between the P5 plus 1 and Iran on the nuclear issue, uh, Mr. Burns traveled there separately, uh, stayed in a separate hotel, 
And while the multilateral negotiations were going on that were led by Secretary of State Kerry and Under Secretary of State Wendy Sherman, uh, Bill Burns was continuing to conduct bilateral diplomacy with the Iranians simultaneously. So this was a multi-layered negotiation. Um, prior to the agreement in November, there's another turning point moment that happened. On 27 September 2013, President Obama telephoned Iran's President Hassan Rouhani uh, as he was leaving uh, New York uh, and heading to the airport. It was the first direct diplomatic contact between the two countries' leaders since 1979. It was a historic moment. Um, so although the interim deal was agreed among the P5 plus one and Iran, uh, it's clear that the direct bilateral negotiations between Washington and Tehran paved the way and made the deal possible. So what does the agreement do? Uh, all in all, I think uh, the first stage agreement is a very good deal for the United States and the West. It ceases uh, Iran's capacity to enrich uranium at 20 percent. And enrichment at that level is easier to weaponize than at a lower level, which is now about between 3 and 5 percent. It bans the installation of advanced centrifuges. Um, centrifuges are used to enrich uranium, and the advanced kind could enrich at a most more effective uh, level. So that's a very important um, part of the agreement. It also prevents the completion of a heavy water reactor called the Iraq uh, reactor, which, if it were to be completed, would produce plutonium, uh, another way to make nuclear weapons. Um, beyond that, Iran agreed to eliminate stocks of its 20 percent enriched uranium. Uh, it also agreed to stronger provisions on verification. There is now regular access to enrichment facilities by the IAEA, the UN's nuclear watchdog. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, the interim agreement allows for six months for negotiations and an additional six months should uh, all the parties agree that they need more time to do a follow-on agreement. So in a nutshell, this agreement has stopped Iran's program from developing. It's put time on the clock for negotiations to reach a comprehensive deal. In other words, it's opened the way for a diplomatic solution. In my opinion, I think the U.S. and P5 plus one partners got more than they gave away. Um, the exchange was seven to eight billion in sanctions relief. Uh, I do want to emphasize that this is a temporary relief in sanctions, mostly on auto production and petrochemical sales, uh, but not on Iran's uh, oil sector, which is its greatest source of revenue. So the sanctions have been eased. They have not been lifted. It's still reversible in the event that Iran backslides. Um, but I think the case uh, can be made that without this interim deal, today Iran would be continuing to advance its nuclear program. Now I want to say a quick word on sanctions here because it's drawn a lot of attention. Some have said uh, Iran came to the table because of the sanctions. Um, so when President Obama began his first term, he extended his hand to Iran and as well as other countries like Myanmar and North Korea. Um, to engage. Um, I think it's fair to say that during President Obama's first term, uh, the emphasis toward Iran was on the pressure track more so than the diplomatic track. Uh, so by that I mean on the sanctions track and coercive measures. Um, there's no doubt that the economic sanctions have been brutally effective. Uh, this is because they were pl applied multilaterally by an international coalition of friends, partners, and allies. Uh, what did sanctions accomplish? They blocked Iran's efforts to modernize its military. They weakened Iran's economy. Uh, they possibly slowed the expansion of Iran's nuclear program. And I'm hesitating on that. Uh, I'll get to that later. And helped add some momentum within the existing framework for nuclear negotiations with Iran. 
Now, sanctions may have slowed Iran's program, but they did not stop its advancement. Uh, ten years ago, uh, there were 3,000 centrifuges spinning in Iran. Today, there are 19,000. When President Obama took office, uh, Iran had 1,000 kilograms of enriched uranium. Now they have 12,000 kilograms. Um, the sanctions did not stop that program from advancing, nor did they improve Iran's human rights practices. In fact, I think many experts think that the sanctions may have empowered anti-reform factions in Iran. Uh, so, uh, and a, a lot of experts make the case that efforts to isolate Iran have not markedly reduced its influence in the region. So the pressure track on its own uh, contributed to an increase in repression and corruption within Iran. It distorted trade patterns. It encouraged the expansion of illegal markets in the region. Um, sanctions related hardships, I think many feared, including myself, um, could have or may have sowed the seeds of long-term alienation between the people of Iran and the people of the United States. So although sanctions played a very important role in getting us to where we're at today, uh, they are not a strategy in and of themselves. Instead, I think they need to be used tactically as part of a larger strategy. They're a blunt instrument um, that are most effective as we're seeing when they are eased or lifted. So what were the other factors that contributed to this development? I think one of the most important was the U.S. turn away from regime change in Iran as a strategic objective. Uh, also, the U.S. making it clear that it was not prepared to accept a nuclear weapons capable Iran, but it was prepared to accept Iran having a peaceful nuclear capability. Uh, additionally, the Obama administration dropped the precondition of requiring Iran to suspend its nuclear enrichment activities in order to begin direct talks on the nuclear issue. <clears throat> Another key factor, without a doubt, was the dis disastrous management of the economy by uh, President Ahmadinejad. A recent report by the IMF concluded the International Monetary Fund concluded that a combination of economic, economic mismanagement, including subsidy reform in late 2010, and the intensification of sanctions led to the contraction of Iran's economy by almost 6% in 2012, 2013, with a rise of inflation from about 12% in late 2010 to around 45% in July, 2013. Uh, since the presidential election and um, uh, President Rouhani's um, term in office, the IMF has said that there have been some signs of stability. The exchange rate has appreciated markedly. 12-month uh, inflation has declined to about 29% in January 2014. But as we've seen in these last recent months, inflation is rising again. The price of gasoline in uh, Iran has jumped sharply just over the last couple of weeks. So it's clear that the economy is still um, uh, experiencing great problems. Another factor that led to this current um, uh, atmosphere is the change in Iran's domestic political context. The election of I'm sorry, Hassan Rouhani as president, who ran on a platform of uh, to end diplomatic isolation, improve the economy, uh, was a key change, I think, that the United States looked upon favorably. Uh, also, it's noted that Rouhani filled out his new team with seasoned ministers and skilled diplomats who were knowledgeable about the United States. I'm thinking about his foreign minister, Javad Zarif, who served on Iran's uh, nuclear negotiating team in 20. Uh, 03 to 2005, uh, very well versed in the complexity of negotiations, very well versed in international law. Um, he also negotiated directly with the U.S. at the Bonn Conference in December 20, 2001. He's been credited with working with the United States in achieving a breakthrough that led to a new Afghan government following 9-11. 
So in this case, I think the team of negotiators that are in place on both sides uh, have developed a good rapport. Um, I think they're approaching the negotiations in a very professional way, which is helping things to move forward. Um, so what would a successful final nuclear deal look like? For any deal to be effective and successful, I think it has to have a certain, uh, several uh, key elements. First, it has to establish verifiable limits on Iran's program that taken together substantially increase the time it would take for Iran to break out of the nuclear NPT and build nuclear weapons. It would also have to increase the ability to promptly detect and effectively respond to that breakout. Um, it would, at the same time, from the Iranians' point of view, preserve key elements of their nuclear program, which would include some uranium enrichment on its own soil, uh, the um, keeping the Arak reactor in place, and some research and development. Uh, and of course, uh, for them, for any deal to be completed, it must remove international nuclear-related sanctions against Iran. So where are we at? Uh, by all accounts, the discussions are proceeding constructively. There have been three discussions at a high level, along with numerous technical level meetings. In fact, there's one going on between experts at a technical level in New York uh, this week and into next week, that will happen. Uh, discussions on a final comprehensive deal are to begin this month. Uh, the next meeting will be May 13th, and at that meeting they're expected to begin drafting the actual text of the final deal. The goal is to wrap it all up by July 20th, which is obviously a very ambitious timeline. Um, at the same time, the IAEA has been verifying that Iran is complying with the agreement um, and making steady progress to all the points that they have agreed to carry out. Um, the Arak facility that I mentioned before was once seen as a major obstacle to reaching the final deal, but there's been surprising progress on this front as well. Um, there's reportedly been um, some talk that an agreement has already been reached to modify this facility that would render it incapable of producing large amounts of plutonium. Uh, a group of, at Princeton University, a group of scientists and experts uh, have come up with a proposal that would significantly reduce the amount of plutonium in the spent fuel from Arak and it appears that the Iranians have embraced this suggestion. So this is a, a creative um, solution to what was once seen as a potentially insurmountable problem. Uh, for the Iranians, they would not agree to dismantle um, this facility, but if it was possible to modify how it works, it allows um, the Iranians to save face uh, keep the facility running, but at the same time would make it more proliferation proof. Um, <clears throat> what are the next steps on the agreement and what are the possible areas of contention or difficulty? So notwithstanding all the positive things I just said, there is still a very, very tough road ahead and gaps remain on a number of key issues. I think the trickiest remaining problem is limiting Iran's enrichment to a level that's consistent with a civilian program. Uh, some of this is perception, uh, but a lot of it is, is technically based. Um, the agreement that was reached in Geneva affirmed Iran's right to a nuclear energy program for peaceful purposes. Um, so the trick now is to put that language into practice. What does it mean? If Iran currently has 19,000 centrifuges, how many would have to be mothballed? How many would Iran agree to be mothballed? So those are the next steps in the negotiation that have to be worked out. I think another uh, potential um, problem in the deal, in reaching the deal, is another facility called Fordow. Uh, this is that underground 
facility um, and because it's built underground it makes it less vulnerable to any airstrike um, and also Iran has been very reticent about clarifying any military dimensions that have happened at this facility. Uh, one potential uh, compromise on this would be to convert Fordo to a research only facilitary, uh, facility as a compromise, but that those discussions um, would just be beginning. Um, another challenge that remains is how to deal with the sanctions. For the past 30 years, uh, Iran ha sanctions have been brought against Iran on multiple subjects. Uh, not only nuclear, but also related to terrorism and other uh, matters as well. So how to identify nuclear-related sanctions versus those on terrorism? Uh, I think one of the biggest key questions in my mind is will a presidential waiver of sanctions be satisfactory for the Iranians to sell it at home? Or um, do they need to be repealed by Congress? Clearly, if it's the latter, we will be facing a very um, uphill battle. Um, meanwhile, opponents to the deal on both sides have been working very hard to undermine it. Uh, some members of Congress are insisting that Iran must abandon all nuclear enrichment activities, even for non-weapon purposes. Uh, I think that would be ideal, but in today's um, situation, it's just unrealistic. And insisting on that would for cer certainly scuttle any chance of a deal. Um, Iranians seriously question if the administration can deliver on sanctions relief, and uh, there's concern about the possibility of Congress being a potential spoiler once a deal is reached and the sanctions are not uh, eased. Uh, President Rouhani and his team are facing similar challenges domestically. They're still very powerful hardliners in Iran. There are people profiting from the sanctions, including the Revolutionary Guard. Uh, so there is great opposition to the nuclear deal. And when you talk to those who actually oppose the deal, the way they see it is that Iran has agreed to contain its strategic assets in exchange for very modern sanctions relief. The word they told me were peanuts. Um, they also think that the interim deal has taken away the urgency for the United States to move ahead with any additional sanctions relief because Iran has already limited its capabilities, relinquishing leverages, leverage for further negotiations. Um, beyond that, uh, Israel has great uncertainty and skepticism about the deal. Uh, in particular, they feel that the military option now lacks, lacks any credibility. Um, they also are concerned that if a final deal is reached, they doubt the international community can effectively monitor Iran's nuclear program. If the deal isn't reached by July, um, many are worried in Israel that negotiations will drag out, that Iran will use it to positive effect and secure more sanctions relief in exchange for little. Uh, Israel would like President Obama to commit to specific action if something goes wrong. In other words, if A happens, they want the U.S. to commit to certain military action. The administration has refused to do this. Um, another sticking point is Israel would like to see the breaking, breakout time that I talked about extended to three years. Uh, in my estimation, I think the maximum is more likely to be about one year. Beyond Israel, there's also great anxiety among the states in the Gulf about uh, this uh, perceived thaw in U.S.-Iran relations. Um, governments in the Gulf feel that they haven't been consulted on the deal, um, and they're worried about how a thaw in relations could disrupt the strategic balance in the Middle East. So a few concluding thoughts. What made this agreement possible? A number of key factors I went through contributed to the successful outcome in Geneva. Uh, chief among them was the leadership at the highest level of both Washington and Tehran wanted the deal to happen. 
uh, then direct under the radar discussions between the U.S. and Iranian officials paved the way for the agreement going forward. And I think it's clear that without this direct diplomatic engagement between the United States and Iran, there would be no deal today. Uh, what role did the change in Iran's political leadership play? Uh, the removal of Mahmoud Ahmadinejad from Iran's political scene and the election of the more moderate Hassan Rouhani as president accelerated the possibility of U.S.-Iran engagement. Uh, the appointment of uh, professional diplomats on his team, seasoned diplomats familiar with the complexities of nuclear negotiations have also uh, cemented the course uh, that they're now on. Uh, what's next on the diplomatic agenda? Uh, the Geneva Agreement is a historic first step. It's meant to serve as a bridge to a final deal. Uh, as I mentioned, the IAEA is monitoring Iran's compliance with the agreement. Uh, in the past, uh, I guess a, a little over a month ago or two months ago, they certified that Iran stopped enriching uranium to 20%. This effectively freezes the program. And more recently, they confirmed that Iran has reduced the stockpile of 20% enriched uranium by nearly 75%. So that is actually the, uh, ahead of schedule, ahead of Iran's commitment that they need to. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, they'll begin negotiating, drafting the final text in the coming weeks. So if the nuclear agreement is implemented successfully, one question um, asked quite a lot, both here in the States and also in the region, is what are the possibilities for deepening uh, U.S. relations with Iran? I think positive regional aspects of a successful nuclear deal uh, are um, within reach. Uh, peacefully and verifiably barring Tehran from developing nuclear weapons could uh, create opportunities for dealing with other important issues and challenges. Uh, this could lead to broader dialogue between the U.S. and Iran on issues in the Middle East and Asia. Uh, I'm thinking of several in particular, the civil war in Syria, which continues to rage, rage on as Assad continues to gain strength. Iran is uh, one of uh, a few or two countries that actually have leverage uh, in Syria. Uh, so if this, if this agreement goes through, uh, we could very well see some direct discussions on the issue of Syria. I think the future of Afghanistan as the U.S. military draws down is another issue for U.S.-Iran engagement. Um, the deteriorating security situation in Iraq is yet another, and security concerns in the broader Persian Gulf as well. I want to go back to Afghan Afghanistan in particular because I think in Afghanistan there are especially strong overlapping U.S. and Iranian interests there. I think both would like to see a strong democratic process, um, a constitutional government take root in Kabul. Uh, I think after these recent elections, the chances of that happening are now greater. Uh, I think both would like to see peaceful relations with the neighbors. Both would like to see sustainable economic development, which would better support security, uh, replacing military aid with development aid. I think both would like to see a capable Afghan security force, a diminished Taliban, and an effective strategy to combat narco trafficking. Uh, as one um, senior Iranian official put it to me, uh, the United States and Iran share common problems associated with radical Islam Islamism, and Afghanistan stuff offers a good starting point for discussion. Um, so the bottom line, I think, is that diplomacy is very, very hard work. Uh, but what are the alternatives? Um, there are only a couple that I see, and they're both very bleak. Uh, one is if these negotiations break down, there will be no restrictions on Iran's program. The second is the military option. Uh, there is an overwhelming consensus of both American and Israeli security experts 
that believe a military strike would be unlikely to permanently disable Iran's nuclear program. Uh, such a strike would also strengthen the regime in Iran. It would spur it to develop its nuclear efforts. So any resort to military force against Iran's nuclear sites would at best only delay Iran's nuclear program, and at worst uh, could lead to a wider conflict and very likely prompt Iran to openly pursue nuclear weapons. So my final thought is um, looking at this past year in U.S.-Iran relations, I think it's been an absolute game changer. Um, it's been a decisive year. After 35 years of hostility and estrangement, U.S. and Iranian officials are talking to each other. I think for those of us and any of you that follow this relationship closely, uh, this has been a historic diplomatic breakthrough. Um, the telephone call that I mentioned between Presidents Obama and Rouhani is um, one instance, but there are uh, meetings now between uh, Secretary of State John Kerry and Iran's Foreign Minister Javad Zarif. Uh, the nuclear negotiating teams meet regularly now. They'll be meeting in New York this week. Uh, there are phone calls now in between these meetings when Wendy Sherman, the Under Secretary of State, recently testified in front of the Senate in Washington. I think she was asked uh, if a question arises about Iran's program, what do you do? And she said, well, I, I email them and ask it. So this is um, a, a profound change in how our countries uh, uh, manage to communicate with each other. Communications are now taking place. The shattering of this decades-long taboo, I think, is a significant win for diplomacy. Um, direct diplomatic engagement between the United States and Iran has finally been tested, and the initial results are promising, and I emphasize initial. Uh, it does leave open the possibility of a genuinely constructive relationship with Iran. Uh, are we on a path toward full diplomatic normalization anytime soon? Probably not. Um, I think I would settle for just a reduction in tensions. Uh, such an atmosphere like that could provide a way to resolve one of the most urgent foreign policy challenges, not only for the United States, but the rest of the world, and that is preventing a nuclear armed Iran, and also, in my mind, avoiding a military confrontation over its nuclear program. So I'm going to stop there, Thomas. I don't know if you want to open it up to yes, questions. Um, we have time for questions. I'll start considering you just got back from North Korea. Are there any lessons from the experience with Iran that can be applied to North Korea? Okay. Uh, yes, I had the opportunity to travel to Pyongyang uh, earlier this year. Uh, and no matter what people tell you, North Korea is not Iran, and Iran is not North Korea. Uh, they're two very different cases. And um, while I was there, one question that did come up was, um, are there any application from the Iran model that could be helpful with North Korea? Uh, I see a couple of issues there. I mean, the obvious one is North Korea has already crossed the nuclear threshold. Uh, and that makes it a very different case. The second issue is that North Korea has reneged on every international agreement it has entered into, and Iran has not. And even this current deal is um, following to the letter. Uh, however, if uh, North Korea looks at the model in the sense that if negotiations were to begin, they would agree to freeze their program the way Iran has, and if they agree that the end result is uh, no nuclear weapons capability the way Iran has, then I would say that would be a very good starting point. But when you look at the situation there, uh, this new leader, uh, the great Marshal Kim Jong-un, uh, he's untested. Um, uh, his recent activities prove he's rather ruthless. I just don't see him giving up this strategic asset at this time. So I'm not optimistic about it. Um, while the US and Russia have had some agreements in the past on Iran, do you see the complication of issues between US and Russia and Putin complicating these negotiations, or how do you see it affecting them? 
Well, I think when everything started happening in uh, Ukraine, there was a great deal of worry that that was the end of the nuclear agreement and the negotiations would go south. But what we have seen is that the Russians have actually uh, uh, continued to focus on the nuclear negotiations in a constructive way, so they managed to keep it separate. Um, I think what's become clear is that it is not in Russia's interest to have a nuclear-armed Iran right to its south with all the problems it's facing, rest of issues down there. The other thing is Russia has a great deal to stand commercially with Iran if things open up. There's already talk of um, big deals happening uh, that have been reported recently. So, so far we haven't seen any negative impact as a result of what's happening in uh, Ukraine. Um, and the, the negotiations seem to be proceeding on track.